Mariana, if you turn on your video a minute, I will take a photo of us. Oh, yes, <laughs> and uh, so hello everyone uh, who's joining right now. We are we are starting our uh, webinar. We'll wait uh, for a few moments for the participants to join. So far, we have six panelists, all of us uh, being present. Uh, we, we have currently 27 uh, attendees, 31, and, and counting up, joining up. Um, so let me introduce a bit of what we'll be talking uh, today and, and uh, how long it will last and why we are discussing this. So my name is Sharunas Narbutas. I am a chairman of Youth Cancer Europe. Uh, I'm coming from Lithuania. I am a cancer patient living with a type of blood cancer, CML, chronic myelogenous leukemia, uh, for what, for uh, 15 years now. Um, and why such a webinar, why we are discussing cannabis? It's because we uh, see a lot of patients uh, in the recent years have uh, been started using a lot of food supplements as, as usual, you know, vitamin C, D, calcium, magnesium. But now there has been a lot of discussion about the cannabis use for uh, again, not imagining like you're smoking a weed, but uh, uh, using it as prescribed by the doctor to negate side effects of the cancer therapies. Uh, and this is what we will be discussing today. So just as a disclaimer, YC is not endorsing in any way, you know, marijuana or cannabis. This is not being sponsored by anyone, by no company behind, you know, cannabis, marijuana, whatnot. We just uh, got uh, interest from uh, our patients in the community that uh, this is a topic that we want to tackle and address to uh, separate myths from reality. So this is why we are speaking about uh, clearing the smoke uh, and, and knowing what, what it means. Uh, before we, I will introduce you to uh, panelists, uh, I want to say that uh, unfortunately one panelist, Lisa Lizanne, is uh, not able to join us because well, she's really not feeling very well, even she really, really wanted to be here, but we'll see maybe you know, in, in the middle of our webinar, she'll still be able to join us. But still, we, we will have uh, five more panelists and me uh, discussing the experiences, lived experiences of uh, uh, using uh, cannabinoids, THC, CBD, oils, etc., for you know fighting uh, cancer fatigue or pain relief or uh, loss of appetite and etc. Uh, and this is also all about you asking questions in in, in the session. So you may see that there is a QA and a button uh, and under this Q&A button, uh, you can post your questions and we'll be sure to answer them. You can upvote, downvote, etc. So, but before I introduce the panelists, we thought we'll do a bit of a, a brief introduction. What is it that we'll be speaking about? Uh, and what is the different forms of cannabis? And for that, I invite uh, Kate Tirisvi, who is a CEO of Youth Cancer Europe to give us a brief a presentation as setting the scene so that we will be understand what we are talking about and we'll be on the same page. So Katie, up to you. Thank you. So you see my screen, right? Yes, we are seeing it. All right, so thank you so, so much. And uh, thank you everyone for joining us and welcome to our webinar. As Sharuna said, there's a little disclaimer here. And I want to uh, say thank you to everyone who has written us comments and asked questions. One of those questions was, will we have oncologists and neurologists on this panel? And as Sharuna said, no. It is just the patient community that we wanted to have this conversation started with. And please note also that we also do not have any lobbyists or representatives of any lobby groups on this meeting nor any sponsors. So that's the reintroduction here. And what is cannabis? So Wikipedia generously provides us with this really pretty uh, picture, but many people would be knowing about cannabis in one of these forms. Cannabis plant comes in many shapes and forms, and I have decided today to include these two, the indica plant and the sativa plant, and you will see in the corners, um, there are indications uh, for use or contraindications and an explanation of how this will affect you. 
But what does it depend on how this plant affects uh, human bodies? Well, it is up to the cannabinoids. What are cannabinoids? And where do they come from? They are locked in the genetics of the plants, but where do they come from? So as we have discussed, it is in the plant, and you will see here a magnified picture of the resin glands of the cannabis plant. And when they are found in plants, they are called phytocannabinoids. However, cannabinoids are also in the human body. We have a very elaborate endocannabinoid system in our bodies, and these act as receptors that interact with the cannabinoids that enter our system. And it is the cannabinoids that are responsible for some of the effects when using cannabis. Other effects might be produced by terpenoids and flavonoids, but we are not going to be talking about those today. And another place where cannabinoids are coming from is of course the lab. Now, these are two of the star cannabinoids that most people know about the CBD and the THC. CBD is sort of like the friendly, friendly relative that uh, people are more comfortable with and talk about more maybe. This is the non-psychoactive component or the non-psychoactive cannabinoid. However, is the THC that is often in the corner and is referred to as the naughty one because this is the psychoactive cannabinoid and what we refer to is the one that causes the high. However, it's good for everyone to know that uh, there are more than 113 so far discovered cannabinoids in cannabis plant. So if you're interested in chemistry and want to dig in, this is a good area for research. Actually, there is a lot more research that needs to come out of this because it is such a complex and still not fully understood plant. So let's talk about CBD first. As we said, this is the more friendly kind, the non-psychoactive cannabinoid. Um, however, it is less found in plants and therefore there are efforts now to cultivate more CBD rich strains so more can be extracted from these plants. In the plants actually what we find is CBD acids and heat is required to convert these acids into CBD. Both the CBD acid and CBD itself are non-toxicating, non-intoxicating. CBD acid releases its effect over time and has been proven to have anti-inflammatory and anti-convulsant effects. And CBD itself has a more immediate effect and it has benefits for pain, anxiety, depression. And there are current research projects ongoing on anti-tumor properties for breast and brain cancer in combination with THC. It's important to note that one is I'm not a specialist on the subject. I'm not a researcher myself. I only know what I found when I've done my desktop research looking into this topic. But even though there is a lot more research that has to come out on cannabis and its use, there are some already proven facts that we can refer to. And one of the important aspects that we need to note is that CBD addresses pain in a very specific way. It is addressing pain that is due to spasticity, convulsions, inflammation, or for example, neuropathic pain that is very important for a lot of our cancer patients, a lot of, a lot of people in our community. Now let's talk about the exciting one, the naughty cousin that causes more trouble a lot of times. It is of course THC or the cannabinoid that makes people feel high and THC acid. So THC is, as we said, the main psychoactive component of cannabis. It is activated with heat. So if you just have THC acid in the plant, it needs to be activated with heat in order for it to become THC and to release some of these effects and, and show some of these benefits such as mild and moderate pain relief 
that has been already proven by a body of research projects. Uh, and this is where we are going to be talking about its use maybe to wean people off of opioids if needed and how it can help in that process in dealing with pain. It has been proven uh, as a very eff effective control of nausea. And here we already have two uh, medical uh, 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 uses to drugs that are actually authorized in the European Union. These are under the brand name of Marinol and Sesamet, and these are available for the control of nausea even in the European Union. They are also known to stimulate appetite and to assist insomnia and can give immediate relief as opposed to the THC acid, which is found in the plant itself and it releases its effect over time. So some people would need to be on a TAC therapy for three to four weeks to be able to uh, experience some of the benefits such as against inflammation or spasticity. And because TAC acid is, is what you see before it is activated through heat, it can be accessed only as juiced cannabis in glycerin or alcohol tinctures that are prepared without any heating. It's important to note though, that if you have a plant that sits on a shelf, in a jar in, in, and is exposed to even room temperature and light and heat, THC may be activated from it. So these are important things to know. And it's also important to know that if you have an any sort of anxiety disorder or you're on a bipolar spectrum or suffer from schizophrenia or any other uh, disease on this spectrum, then please consult with your doctor and with your specialist because um, using any of these cannabinoids can um, uh, exacerbate your symptoms and cause you harm. So it's very important that you're going to be very smart about this. And another very important uh, warning that we have to issue on this webinar is that you are aware of the legalities. And I think the most important thing that we need to understand is that the United Nations of the world has agreed in three consecutive treaties about cannabis use, growth, sale, um, and these are governed by or written and signed in three different treaties in 61, in 71, and in 88, so a long time uh, ago. And the bottom line is, as, as it is described in these treaties, that cannabis is classified as a Schedule I drug under the Single Convention Treaty, meaning that signatories can allow medical use but that it is considered to be an addictive drug with a serious risk of abuse. Now, we do have some updates to this and they are very recent. So if we consider how old those documents are, these updates have come just really recently. In January, 2019, the WHO that has actually become uh, a common word and, and, and more a household a name just because of the pandemic. And I think a lot of people now know what the WHO stands for, the, uh, the World Health Organization expressly recommended that cannabis uh, should be rescheduled and also provided clarity to its treatment of cannabinoids uh, like CBD. Very specifically for the first time describing that any substance with less than 0.2% THC in it should not be considered as a drug. Now, this motion has not been passed yet, has not been addressed yet. And in November 2020, so literally just six months ago, the European Court of Justice published a judgment and it is this a judgment on, on one very specific case that started in 2017 in the courts, stating that cannabidiol extracted from the cannabis plant should not be considered a drug under the 1961 United Nations Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs. So these are the latest updates. But it's very important for everyone to be aware of the legalities. And this is a global picture. You will see on this map where it is legal 
or illegal but decriminalized. Sharon Ross will explain that a little bit more for you later. Or illegal but often unenforced or a hard no, illegal to possess any cannabis for recreational use in these countries. And we know that just a week ago, uh, New York, actually not even a week ago, New York has post uh, has uh, reviewed this legislation and has legalized uh, cannabis. So that map should change just a little bit. And here we have another map about the whole plant's medical use. So the, the legal, the, the blue bits have not changed are the same as on the other map. You can use it as you wish for recreational or medical purposes. However, we will see uh, a growing number of green regions where it is legal if it is authorized by a physician. Very important for everyone to know, and this is one of the last things about the legality is I think we need to just make sure that we firmly put out here in this webinar that there are penalties for consumption and penalties for possession of cannabis and this is in Europe so on our continent please pay attention to this and there is a difference of course in some countries you will be penalized but not incarcerated but to answer our original question on whether uh, using or having cannabis on you even medical cannabis on you can land you in jail well look at the map and as promised, here is one slide about those medications that have been approved by the European Medicines Agency, the European Union's uh, Authority on Marketing Authorization. And you will see that there are at least two drugs there that are recommended for patients in can for cancer treatment. And this is because they alleviate um, uh, effects of uh, nausea or in some extent pain. So these are the two ones that have a, a marketing authorization for cancer patients in the EU. If you want to know more about the European Union, there is one body, the European Monitoring Center for Drug and Drug Addiction. They have a website, you can go and dig in there a little bit. However, again, it's very important to note that the cannabis legislation in Europe uh, document that I'm showcasing here was uh, written in 2017. There is, an, uh, there, is, there is a question and answers a document on the medical use of cannabis and cannabinoids in December 2018. And the most recent one is about low THC cannabis products in Europe, which was published literally only three months ago. Very important to note that there is no harmonized EU law on cannabis use. The criminal or administrative response to drug use offenses is the responsibility of each EU member state and not the European Union. So this is the very rich tapestry of uh, the European legal system addressing cannabis use and I say that probably this will also have to be updated, but this is the last, the latest information that I found, and you will see all the European countries listed on this slide. Uh, after the, the name of the country, the first column addresses recreational use, and the second column addresses uh, medical use of uh, medical cannabis. And because uh, the United Kingdom is no longer part of the EU, they deserved a separate slide. And I also did this because we will have two speakers today that will be talking about their unique experiences. And both of them come from the United Kingdom and they will tell us about two very distinct and very different approaches and different experiences. And this slide might explain why. Um, so let's use this as a little case study. So we see for recreational use, it is illegal, but most likely you will not be prosecuted. You will just be given a penalty or a notice of dis for disorder. However, for medical use, it does state that it is legal when prescribed by a specialist consultant. So what does this mean? Cannabis derived medicines are only legal when prescribed by a specialist consultant. So GPs or family doctors, as they are referred to in many places in Europe, are not allowed to prescribe cannabis-derived medicines. Uh, 
And the NHS guidance states that medical cannabis should only be prescribed when there is clear published evidence of its benefits. So this would be taken care of by an EMA uh, recommendation or author uh, marketing authorization. But there is another part of the sentence where it says, and other treatment options have been exhausted. Is this a little bit too wide? Is this too open to personal interpretation? And I'm going to close with a fun story. I don't know how many of you know it, but there is a little borough of Estonia called Kanepi. Now, Kanep in Estonian no means problem. cannabis in uh, English. So when in 2018, the local authorities opened a public consultation for the new image of the borough and for the new flag and the coat of arms, some foreigners got wind of it and actually put in a proposal for this flag. Now, 12,000 yes votes came in from the population of only 5,000 Kanepi residents. And it so baffled the local authorities that they as, and ended up having an and inside a, a closed uh, room vote uh, within the leaders themselves, where also only the yes votes were confirmed. So. Lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually the official and a public coat of arms and flag of the Canopy Borough of Estonia, as it was confirmed by popular vote. And this is it from now. Thank you so, so much. I look forward to the discussion as we are here today to clear the smoke. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And uh, it's very good to hear, uh, you know, all, all of the, while topic is serious, but all of the nice ways to tackle it. And uh, what we will be uh, addressing in this webinar uh, will be most of the lived experience the, from the peer uh, cancer patient survivors. Uh, and uh, this is where I will shortly uh, start with our introduction with our fellow analysts, uh, but in the meantime, uh, having a polls, a first poll for you, uh, where we want to see whether you have used uh, cannabis in any form uh, for recreational purposes. So I'm launching the poll now, we'll leave it for a few minutes. Uh, so in the meantime, the uh, panelists will introduce themselves. So again, we will not be going in detail as uh, interventions, but just for you to know uh, who are the people uh, that you will be listening uh, from today, uh, what, what type of cancer they have, where are they coming from, and then we will go into a, a more in-depth uh, stories. So let's start with Nicola. Hi, everyone. I'm Nicola. I'm 26 years old and live in Germany, but I'm originally from the States. And I have a cross form of Burkitt's lymphoma and Burkitt's leukemia. And I'm currently nine months in remission. Hello. Good to have you with us, Nikki. So, Andrea. Andrea Ruano. Hi. Um, I'm Andrea. I'm from Spain and I am 28. And I had e sarcoma. 13 years ago now. So yeah, it's been quite a while. <laughs> Good to have you with us. And Catherine from UK. Hi, I'm, I'm Catherine from London. I'm 25 and I was diagnosed with a rare incurable sarcoma in August 2017. Hello, Catherine. James, over to you. Hi, uh, my name is James. I'm 24 from Birmingham in the United Kingdom or around about to see you. Um, I was diagnosed with acute lymphoblastic leukemia in 2015. Good to see you, James. Mariana? Hi, I'm Mariana from Portugal. I'm 27 years old and uh, I was diagnosed four years ago with a rare form of cancer, a type of vascular sarcoma in the liver. And at the moment, the disease is considered stable. And I will be talking about the current situation in Portugal regarding the legalization of medical cannabis. Thanks. Thank you all. So this is a, uh, just the first uh, tip of, uh, you know, people from the countries will be hearing from. So 
We have Lithuania here. Katie discussed uh, European-wide situation, but we're also going into other continents. Uh, we have Nikki, who's actually from a, coming from US, but living uh, in Germany uh, and has an experience with um, with the cannabis being used for for the can during the cancer therapy. So why don't we start more with uh, you, Nikki? So could you explain more about uh, you know so when you were diagnosed and the things you were feeling and how did it uh, end up in a, that you were prescribed cannabis? Um, I was diagnosed the first time when I was 11 years old. The cannabinoids came way later when I was about 15. Um, and I was struggling a lot with pain and nausea. And in the States, it's pretty simple, actually. It's quite common there to use it for medical purpose, but by now also recreational use. So um, my doctor basically introduced me to it there and it worked really well and yeah yeah and so when you were, were was getting uh, this prescription what was the doctor telling to you why do you need to use it for management of your side effects specifically or just you will feel better was no, it an open conversation that you were having or he told me it might be helping with the pain and with sleeping better and maybe eating a lot more without vomiting right afterwards. And it did most of that for me. So it really was a really good step. And, and the, what was the situation when you were trying to get this uh, cannabis, for instance, you get the prescription and you are living in Germany, right? Where, where, where specifically? And how was the situation when you tried to get it? Um, in Germany, it was quite complicated because there's a lot of per paperwork to do for getting it. And most doctors are just not willing to do that or not informed enough to do it. So it was quite the hustle to get it. And it took about six to seven months until it was finally through. So six to seven months. So like you've got a prescription for something you would need to use. You would be going normally to the pharmacy and you just can't get the prescription. So what did they say? And... Um, at first, it was really a few places where you could hand in those prescriptions. By now, um, I checked it again. There's almost every every town has a pharmacy that has it so out of 10 pharmacies one usually has it but they still have to order it you have to bring in your order what you're going to get and it takes two or three days and they get it straight for you and what's it in, in comparison when you try to use this prescription in in the states you just get a medical card and go to the dispensary and it's basically like a candy store literally you and can, you take whatever you want. Yeah, prescribe, not prescribe. There's little glasses with weed in it, and you can smell them, see which one you like, which you like the smell of. And there's even glasses with coffee beans to neutralize your nose again. And there's candies. They have hard candies. They have brownies. There is so much stuff. It's crazy. It really is. So, Nikki, when you were uh, saying, like, they, they said it is for the pain relief, or what, what was it uh, that you were feeling, the, the effects? And again, just to clarify, we were speaking of that you were getting THC, right? Not the CBD, yes. or it was a mix, or no, it changed from it time to time. THC. So, um... Yeah, and, and so what was... The pain was not really less, but it was easier to endure it, if, they, if that makes any sense. And I, I was functioning better. I could do more stuff, even though I still felt crappy. So that was really good. And, and did you feel something, uh, something else? Like you were taking a pain management medicines uh, before, right? Because if you said it took like seven months to get the prescription. So in the meantime, you had to use something for the pain management. Is it something you can compare with? Uh, and and you, if you remember the, the medicine that you were taking for the pain management, what, what was the feeling? Most of the time. And it was not really like the, it's like, sitting on a cloud and having to talk through a wall and everything is just really slow. And it makes you less functional for the most part. 
So in, in terms of this THC that you were getting, how, how long were you using it? Was it like month and a break or it's a constant and, and for what periods? It's, it's a constant for about four years. Yeah. And are you still using it? Yes. For, for the prescriptions? Yeah. And now you're saying it's, it's easier to get it in Germany right now? It got a lot easier over the years. Yeah, at least so as long as you, you already have the prescription to get to the point where you get the prescription, it's still a really long process. But as long as, as you already have it, it's quite easy from there. And in Germany, when you are speaking with uh, fellow patients, you know, is there is discussion going on about, you know, what type of food supplements you're using to negate side effects during cancer? Is it something more particular about uh, cannabis? Or do you feel like it's a not open conversation yet? Like there's a lot of stigma or that when people say cannabis, they all, always assume weed and uh, not, not for, to be used for medical purposes. What's your experience? Um, for right now, it's not really an open conversation yet. I wish it was. Um, younger patients are talking quite a lot about it, but most of them are struggling to get to that point um, where they actually get the prescription because most doctors are just not open to it yet, apparently. And yeah, but about the CBD, there's a lot of conversation going on, actually. What do you mean by, by the conversation? Like it's not worth using it or it doesn't work or it's like, don't use it because it's bad. No, actually, most people like it. I have a friend who is an amputee. He lost his leg to osteosarcoma sarcoma, and it helped him tremendously with um, the pain in the leg that wasn't there anymore. The phantom pain. Phantom pain. Yeah. So let, let's pause here for, for a second, because I, as you mentioned here, uh, we'll be bringing Andrea as well in, in, uh, to follow up on the, the pain management side. Uh, but just uh, that we did a vote, right? And we saw that 55% uh, of people said that have been used, uh, they have used cannabis in any form for recreational purposes. So meaning in, in a form that we think is not related for the medical use, so just to feel better, and a little uh, less than half have not used it. So it's good to see that we have people who are relevant with the topic, and this is where we'll try to make a distinction between you know just using cannabis to feel good versus to to actually improve the clinical outcomes in, in during the, the cancer uh, therapy. So Andrea, can, can we go over to you, and if you could explain more a bit it about also your type of, of cancer and your type of pain uh, management that you have to do and are st still have um, are facing issues uh, today in terms of what type of pain medicines you were taking how they were helping and just in in, in general not not specific to, to cannabis yeah so when i was diagnosed i was 15 and like for i guess for my parents it was easier to to just say no to it because like marijuana in spain is not in a great place at the minute it's quite um you know it's not used medically basically it's just used for recreational and as katie has explained before it's it's quite um, you know, you can get fines if, if police uh, finds you with it and, you know, all of those things. But in terms of, of when I was um, with a chemotherapy, um, my parents were offered um, homeopathy. And for them, was that was like an easy yes. And I always wonder, like, why is that such an easy yes? And, you know, maybe um, like a brownie, like a pot brownie is such a hard no for you. And I think it's the stigma that there is in Spain at the minute where, where marijuana and, you know, cannabis is just seen as a really bad thing. Um, and for me, I think it would have helped so much because my treatment was really strong. Um, and then afterwards for, for the, all the pain management that I, that I have to deal with, um, because in the first surgery I got um, my nerve um, injured, 
So that means that I have chronic pain uh, from the knee downwards. Um, and I've been in all types of medication, really. At the moment, I'm, I'm actually taking morphine um, to deal with it and lots of, um, what's the name? Well, um, nerve medication, basically, that the deals with it and like a, like a prescription amount that is like an amplifier for it. And yeah, there's lots of things that I think it could have been so much easier had I have um, a weed, not a weed, like, but like the gummy bears or, or something, either for all the nausea that I've had that I still have because of all the pills and, you know, to treat things without having to take so, so many pills. Um, but, but yeah, it's, in Spain, it's just not great. <laughs> That's the main uh, conclusion and it's not used and it's not talked about. I mean, in, in one of the last times that I was, I went to see my doctor, I told him that thanks to Nikki, I started using a vape. Uh, she recommended it for me for all the, the nerve pain. And his, his answer was like, oh yeah, you're, you're, you're the crazy one that is always trying new things, but kind of not, not taking it seriously, but not giving it importance. Um, if that makes sense. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, I think it should be more open here in Spain and, you know, deal with it more. But So what, what you said in the beginning, it's important, like you said, it was more difficult because of your parents. Like they were not thinking like for all of the, uh, you know, cannabinoids and etc. like you should make use of that. It's still something like we'll do things that, that, that you are doing and just deal with the morphine or, or something else. But when mm -hmm. you approach doctors, is it like they, they shy away from this conversation when you with your oncologist or it's, it's uh, they, they know how the pain management medicines work and they don't know so much how the cannabis medicine would work. And this is why they don't want to discuss a yeah lot about. I think they they really don't know and um so I only see my oncologist once a year now and this year it was the first time that I met my new one and I met her on the phone and I really you know I literally forgot to mention it <laughs> I was like there was more like other things to, to discuss like blood works and, and stuff so I just didn't even mention it because she wasn't even I don't think she would have given me any input um at this moment you know i could have used so much the the cannabis back back then that now it's just you know i kind of just deal with it um but yeah i've also tried the the cbd oil as like a massage oil for the leg and that hasn't done anything you know i i think that it does things for people but with my nerve damage I haven't, you know, it hasn't done anything. So it's it's like okay, fine. Um, but I can I can say the, the CBD, like the vape for the anxiety and you know for the nerve pain, it doesn't remove all of it, but it does help. So you know, I'm grateful that at least I have that now. Yes, yeah, so what you are saying for the pain management, you're using like the most heavy artillery there is, like morphine and etc. And like mm -hmm, if you mm -hmm. would use just the CBD oils, which is just like very, very light thing, it, it, it doesn't work for the pain management. But for instance, what you said for helping to deal with anxiety, like vaping, etc., it, it still helps. But you haven't yeah. tried THC, uh, right, for the pain, uh, pain management. So for uh, the no, no way, no, I say no, but uh, back in uni, um, a friend uh, offered me a joint uh, one day and because he said uh, he knew his stuff about marijuana and when he had like hash, he was like, no, 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 this is not the thing you need to try because he knows that I don't, I don't use, but one day he was like, oh, you really need to try this one because it's going to help with the pain and it was a bunch of people who, we, we met up and I remember that everyone was laughing and having a great time, but the only thing that I felt is the pain went away. Uh -huh. So I wasn't high, but the pain went. So I was just amazed with that. For me, it was like, oh, wow, hang on, what's going on? And everyone was just having the time of their lives. And I was just really concentrated on the fact that for, like, for the first time in years, all the pain was basically like muted. That's the, the best description that I can give. It was like, it hasn't like someone put like a plug on it, like, shh, 
stop it. Um, and then obviously he came back, but it was an interesting um, thing to, to learn. But my parents have always had like this negative view on on marijuana and, and cannabis that I've really never like pushed towards it. Um, but now, I mean, I guess I'm old enough now that I was just like, I'm going to get a vape. <laughs> That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Andriana. <laughs> very good. Very Every parent ever is, is like that. <laughs> this is what we get as a comment. So um, let's uh, let's hear from Catherine about, uh, you know, your situation when you were diagnosed and uh, whether you had actually to deal with a lot of pain or, or as we know, it, it might have been some other things that you were experiencing during the, the chemo and the later treatment circles. Um, yeah, so the main symptom I had before I was diagnosed, I had um, a huge tumour on the back of my leg and I was misdiagnosed and given steroid treatment that made it worse and really made it hurt. Um, so I had about a week or so where it was I was in agony and I was just given morphine for that. Um, and through like my first surgeries and my like journey to finally getting a diagnosis I was given opioid treatments um and you know the the main thing with like morphine and things like that is you can't feel pain if you're not conscious so I don't really have a strong memory of all of that um but after I was diagnosed um and I'd had some chemotherapy treatment I had a combination of chemotherapy side effects and quite advanced cancer that meant that I was really sick like I was just being sick all the time and um, so I was underway and my quality of life was just not good at all because I didn't even want to leave the house because I was being sick so much um and my consultant at the time was on a sabbatical and the doctor that came in to cover was from Canada, which I believe is slightly more further along in terms of like medical cannabis and things like that. Um, and I'd sort of reached the end of the road on every other anti-sickness available and brought it up with this Canadian doctor and was like, I am just at my wits end. I, I'm so fed up, nothing's working. I've tried everything, um, what can we do? Um, and she recommended trying Nabilone, um, which is a synthetic cannabinoid. Um, and I managed to get that through my hospital um, because my hospital for cancer treatment is um, dedicated to cancer treatment. It's not a ward, it's just solely for cancer. So they had um, maybe your slightly more esoteric or rare drugs and treatments like in the pharmacy so it was easier to prescribe um so yeah I guess that's my journey to getting a, a diagnosis and to getting on some uh, medical cannabis I guess and and what was the discussion you were having with the doctor the doctor started it or it was something you googled or spoke with your other fellow patients how how did it uh, came up I looked on the Cancer Research UK They've got like a whole section about chemotherapy drugs and supportive treatment. Um, and I was looking at their options about anti-sickness because like I said, I'd like tried everything um, and nothing was really making a difference or it would make a difference for like a week or two, but then it would fail again. Um, so I kind of had read that Nabilone was being used in the UK for cancer patients where all other anti-sickness antiemetics had failed. I brought it up to my consultant, this Canadian doctor, um, but I wasn't 100% like, sure if she would take me seriously or if it was even possible to get prescribed because, you know, sometimes you read something, it says it's, it's possible, but it doesn't mean in practice it's actually like in pharmacies or, or just available to, to get delivered or anything, I don't know. So I was kind of um, nervous, but because I had quite a poor prognosis at that, that time, I also thought I haven't really got anything to lose. The worst thing is they're gonna say no, and I'll be in the same position I am going into the conversation. So, yeah. 
So what were you feeling in, in terms like what you, you said, you get the synthetic cannabinoid and what was uh, any side effects or any in particular that, that you remember? Um, it did work really well. It did cut down my sickness, which was like the first step in stabilizing my disease, I think, because I was so underweight that I was really struggling with like tumor burden, tumor load and all those kinds of things. And just like getting chemotherapy, I was so underweight that it was a real struggle to get the dose right. Um, so reducing the sickness for me was kind of the first step in continuing chemotherapy treatment and reaching the point I'm at now, which is where my disease is stable. Um, so, sorry, can you repeat the question? I've gone down a rabbit hole now. No, no, no. That was a very, very good one. But just the question was exactly what were you feeling? So you were saying you were underweight and it worked well, but any in particular, you know, just, just the positive things or some, some, I don't know, dulliness or yeah, uh, from, from just taking medicines. I don't have super strong memories of that time period, partly because the side effects of the Navalone was that it like wiped me out. Um, in the end, I did have to come off of the Navalone because I think it built up in my system and I'd been on a very, very strong dose. Um, and I ended up having a fit uh, in my house, came to with my head like bouncing off of the bath. Uh, <laughs> but luckily at that point, it had kind of done its job enough that I'd got stronger and all of that, like I was saying before. Um, so it did what I needed it to do, but it wasn't like a, a magic bullet as much as maybe I wanted it to be. And how long were you using it for? Just during the chemo or if um, you remember in months or? I think about three months. I had to have a break off of chemo because my first ever dose of chemo hit me like a train. I was in a ICU, intensive care unit uh, with um, neutropenic sepsis and really, really struggling. And at that point, there was a kind of question of, can I continue chemotherapy or is it a matter of like palliation, palliative care, making me comfortable, which I think contributed to the doctor's comfort in diet, in prescribing for me. Um, because it wasn't like, if I was going to have any side effects, like how much worse can you get than the point I was at? Um, so, yeah. Uh, th thank you, K uh, Catherine, for sharing this. And it's especially like what I would reference back to Nikki's story and Andrea's story and your story really, really had a very um, poor prognosis in, 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 in the out outcome of the cancer. And here you are today, smiling, looking be beautiful, uh, you know, all three of you. And, uh, you know, after this, now what we are seeing, uh, you know, years back, it's really, really good uh, to see and for those participants who don't know your personal stories, it's just, you know, we are, we are hearing from the cancer survivors uh, that really did not have an easy go in a park, not an easy walk. And uh, there are many, many different facets we can, um, we could ask and discuss outside of just cannabis because this webinar is just tailored to debunk the, the all of the myths, but you know, Post us, shoot us a question about whether we should speak the issues where patients are dealing with when uh, on the chemotherapy uh, to see if it is, uh, you know, uh, some other techniques or management things we all try to do uh, to, to do better. But now the next speaker will be James. But before we go to James, let me launch an, a second polling, uh, which asks uh, whether you have used the cannabis in any form uh, during or in connection with your cancer therapy or managing side effects or long-term effects. So this is a question if you have used cannabis not for recreational purposes, but uh, as something which was advised to you or prescribed to you by the doctor. And again, what we mean CBD, it is something that does not have a psychotropic activities uh, and, and can be used as an oil, et cetera, uh, is, is legal in all over Europe. And when we speak about THC, it is cannabinoid, uh, which has a, a psychotherapy effect and is not legal in all of the countries uh, based to the 
uh, maps that Katie was showing, but we'll get back to that after we hear more from, from our panelists. So I'll leave this for uh, another minute or so, uh, but let's, let's go and start uh, hearing from James. And uh, we know James was not using, uh, has not uh, used cannabis in beer. Uh, but, you know, in terms of uh, James, your experience during your cancer therapy and what you did to manage the side effects that you were feeling. Uh, hi. So, yeah, I had some quite severe side effects throughout most of the treatments, uh, especially regarding sickness and pain that were managed at different times. Uh, I think. The, there was one thing that I never really had to explore, which was managing hunger because I was on steroids for pretty much most of my treatment, which made me pretty much want to chew through the drywall in every room that I was in. So that wasn't too bad. Um, but I think managing the pain um, was, was quite difficult because it, it, and especially the sickness as well, it took the doctors a long time to get it right. It was only after a few different cycles of the chemotherapies that were causing different issues for me. Um, that it was that they found something that was strong enough um, in each time to manage the symptoms correctly. Um, and I think it, it was almost like hitting an egg with a sledgehammer when they would give me that for when it was mild pain, but because they found a level of um, painkillers and anti-sickness that they could give me that just worked um, as a blanket, that that's what I would get every time from that point. So it sort of worked its way up the scale to eventually end up on Oxynorm, uh, which is like the step above morphine which was then prescribed for me whenever anything went wrong at all, um, especially when um, I was complaining about joint pain um, post-treatment due to the, the steroid breakdown of my hips. Um, and they just gave me a bottle of morphine. They didn't give me um, codeine or anything along those lines. They just like, went straight up and they were like, here's a bottle of morphine. And I just feel like there was such a, a strange... Um, opinion around pain management as opposed to uh, like experimenting with lower dose painkillers or lower dose antiemetics or looking at experimental treatments like using um, cannabis as well. And what were you uh, feeling, you know, on these uh, painkillers? Like you said, it's so close to morphine and we know and we hear like for morphine, it, you know, you pretty much don't remember things. You are feeling like there's not much you can do. Now you were seeing like you wanted just to lick every wall <laughs> and <laughs> that. So what is it, you know, being on the painkillers? How does it affect your mental state? I mean, having been to Amsterdam and, uh, you know, had brownies, etc., um you know that's that's being high and being relaxed whereas um being on painkillers is like you're not in the room you know uh morphine's good enough but then oxynorm i mean I, there's always the good story of when i was eating a cooked breakfast and was eating the same sausage for two hours because i was just so spaced out in the mornings um so i think you know the the comparison of the medical grade painkillers which just completely knock you for six and especially um, I had um, I'm going to forget the name of it but I had a really strong um, anti-emetic uh, that basically caused um, it was uh, a palliative sedative as well at the same time so it essentially meant that I slept for pretty much seven days straight and was having the same conversation with my dad that was with me over and over again because I was just in and out of consciousness pretty much for the entire time um, as opposed to, of course, as we've spoken about, the, the pretty good anti properties that cannabis could have, um, which I feel like it would be better to explore more options rather than, again, just going straight to the top. How much I appreciate not being sick because I was asleep. I also would have enjoyed, enjoyed not having to pretty much sleep off two months of my life. <laughs> two months. So was it these two months that you were taking the, the painkillers and, and then you were just got out of that situation or it went to the lighter, uh, lighter ones? And... Yeah, no, it's, so it was for, I was on um, high dose methotrexate as part of a uh, chemotherapy trial of which um, like had severe side effects, like completely um, messed with my body, of which that was when the doctors upped the medication until it reached a certain point. And then it was like they realized that... Um, Oh. levopromazine that was it the palliative um, sedative they just got to that point and they were like this is going to knock you out but it means that you're not going to be able to be sick and because my cycles were so long um, because of how much that I am um, you needed inpatient um, care and staying uh, to manage uh, the side effects that after the first cycle they reached this point and they were like 
okay, we're just going to give it you every time you come in. And because it was like two weeks per cycle and then the intermediary as well, they basically just gave it me to come home with too. So yeah, it was like six to eight weeks that I was essentially on this sedative for that period of time. And like that part of my life is gone, doesn't exist in my mind anymore. Well, it doesn't seem that your memory is so impacted. You remember all of the nitty gritty, uh, you know, medical name for all of the things you had. So it's, it's much better than... To I wreck my brain. <laughs> uh, okay, let, let's see how we are doing with our polls. Um, and the results uh, show that, uh, you know, out of when we're seeing like half of the people, more than half have tried cannabis for recreational uses, we see that only like 30% uh, of them have uh, have tried it for the medical use. And we see if it is a mix of CBD and THC. So again, the CBD is these oils that you can buy online and they don't have any, any psychotropic uh, activities in there. Uh, uh, and these are like of a lighter use. And then you have a THC, which is uh, legal in countries where we know weed is legalized, maybe legal in some countries where it is just for the medical use. And in some countries, it still remain not accessible to even to the cancer patients when they can uh, use it to address the, either the, the breakthrough cancer pain or the appetite loss or dizziness or sleep or whatnot. Uh, and then we see that uh, many people have not tried it and we have, we just see that we, there are not the patients, maybe their caregivers, maybe uh, doctors, you know, watching our webinar. So uh, by using this opportunity, I want to say that we had eight, uh, participants from 18 countries uh, joining this webinar. So it's really good. And by now we are also being live streamed in Facebook. And uh, for ones of you that were joining later or would have to leave earlier, rest assured that all of the recording of the session will be available in Youth Cancer Europe uh, Facebook stream. So you can check it at your own convenience. Good, thank you, James. Uh, let's let's go to Portugal and uh, let's hear from Mariana, who uh, will speak more to our regulatory issues and, and the legal initiative and we were supposed to legalize uh, this cannabis uh, use uh, in cancer therapy and, and how it is. But also, Mariana, speak a bit to, to your own story and whether you know there was any conversation about using the, the cannabis with your doctor uh, or, or just with a fellow cancer patients. Okay, so uh, in my particular case, I never, I personally never used any form of uh, medical cannabis. So, uh, so far, I didn't do any aggressive treatments and I don't feel pain very often. Um, but of course, if in the future I get worse or start experiencing lots of pain and nausea, I would definitely consider talking with my oncologist about the possibility of um, uh, experimenting. Uh, uh, the medical cannabis because um, of course I think it, sh it should also we should always um, discuss these things because for example in my case I it's not recommended for me to take vitamin E supplements which is apparently something seemingly harmless but it could actually promote the growth of cancer cells in my particular case so um, and this was told this I was uh, told about this by one of my doctors uh, so yeah but uh, this has been a kind of a hot topic recently in Portugal uh, because last week medical cannabis actually became available in Portuguese pharmacies and now patients who have a prescription to, to buy it, they can buy it at uh, pharmacies here in Portugal. Um, but until very recently, it was not possible. Um, now, Portugal apparently is the, lar has the largest uh, medical cannabis uh, plantation in Europe. Uh, because we apparently have the best climate to, to grow the plant. But until very recently, the companies that are producing it in Portugal, they were exporting it to other countries like the Netherlands or Germany. But the patients, the Portuguese patients who could maybe benefit from the plant and um, use it, they were not, it was not available for us. And we, we also cannot uh, grow it at home uh, for that matter. But uh, anyway, that's a, a topic for a whole another conversation. Um, but yeah, it was not possible for the patients to use it, even though there were lots of companies here producing medical cannabis. Um, 
But in 2018, uh, the Portuguese government approved the legislation of cannabis-based medicines. So it became available for, available for patients who had a medical prescription, who, who were diagnosed with uh, certain types of um, diseases, and cancer is one of them. Uh, and also, um, they, it, it would be available for them if they, if they were uh, as I said, diagnosed with um, certain types of diseases. So um, right now, the, the product that is available, uh, it has a level of 18% of THC and less than 1% CBD. And as far as I know, the costs won't be covered by the public health insurance. So the patient uh, needs to, 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 to buy it from their own pocket. Um, and yes, I think this is it right now that I have to share about Portugal. Uh, I just took some notes so I don't forget about anything because this is relatively new. Um, oh, they are selling it for uh, 150 euros here in Portugal. So it means uh, 15 grams um, for one, 150 euros. It means 10 euros per gram. Uh, so yes, I don't think it will be available for uh, all the patients, uh, unfortunately, I think many people won't be won't have access to it because of the costs. Um, and yeah. And Mariana, you said government is currently not paying for it, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it was just now able to. How do you get it? Do you go like to local pharmacy and they make it like this? What is called an extemporary drug, like they had to make it in the place, or you just buy it off the shelf? Uh, so from what I understood, they are selling the dry plant, the dry flower, um, and the, it should be administered through, through vaping. So the patients should be inhaling the, this, this product. And this is also, I think, a limitation because uh, we would like to have more forms of um, medical cannabis available. At least I'm speaking for myself. I have some uh, lung nodules. So I wouldn't be very keen on smoking uh, or inhaling the, the plant. I would prefer to, for example, to take edibles or oils or capsules, whatever. Uh, but these forms are still not available. And yes, yeah, so the doctors right now only can prescribe the, the dry flower for inhaling. And this is uh, actually, uh, there's another thing I wanted to mention that until now, uh, the law was approved in 2018 and until now, doctors in practice, they could prescribe it, but they didn't know which dosage, which form, uh, where should they tell patients to buy it because it was still only available through the black market. And, uh, but now it is finally available in pharmacies. But like I was saying there, I think there's still a lot of limitations. However, it's a step forward. And I think it's positive that it became a treatment that is now approved by the authority that regulates the medicines in Portugal. Thank you, Mariana. Let me tap a bit into this because this is a similar situation in Lithuania where I am living. Uh, because in 2018, it is uh, also the law was passed to be uh, allow for the medical use of cannabis. So weed is still illegal, but if you get prescription, you can buy it. Uh, and that law should have entered into force last year, but nothing has happened. So even there was a lot of public debate about pros and cons and seeing that, look, even the medicines are registered that has cannabis uh, in European Union and you have CBD and THC, and uh, it's just with a you know, limited number of patients. So it included like like patients with multiple sclerosis, uh, with a cancer, uh, with Alzheimer's, uh, and that's it. And, and still in reality, this hasn't started to function. Uh, and uh, we know of the situations where after there was a lot of PR in the media, the patients were, for instance, being um, treated, you know, to, to go uh, to treat the cancer, for instance, in Italy or in Austria, where it is actually legal to prescribe THC and they get prescriptions uh, from the doctors. They take the course there, maybe they are there two, three weeks and they come home uh, and on the, in the airport, you know, when you have to go uh, through the customs, even that's, you know, European Union, you have to either declare that you have something or to say, no, I don't have anything that is to be declared. And, uh, you know, of course there are dogs sniffing it. 
And so there were cases where the patients were coming with a legal prescription with, a, you know, leftovers of a, of a, um, a THC that they bought either in Italy or in Austria. And they walk through the airport doors and they get arrested like they are criminals. And we are speaking about, you know, elderly patients in the 70s, 80s, also palliative uh, patients. Uh, that now are left in all of this hangover and something that was Katie was explaining, like there is different regulations in different uh, countries. So this is where the problem actually uh, kicks in. Uh, and this problem is uh, uh, further, uh, you know, enforced, like, you know, all of us living in European Union, uh, it is one market, right? We are able to order goods from Germany, from France, from Spain, ship it via Amazon, whatnot. And guess what? In, if in that country, you know, the cannabis is legal to be say, uh, like in Netherlands, for instance, or again, what I said in uh, Italy, it is legal to purchase. You can get it from pharmacy or you can get it from online store. So means you can ship it, you know, to Romania or to Lithuania. But if you ship it on the receiving end, then you are coming it, you become a drug trafficker and you may end up in prison. And this is something that no one is explaining. No one is telling you, like, uh, be cautious about it. There is no disclaimers in these, uh, you know, online websites and you just can uh, end up in trouble. And this is something which is why we also wanted to do this uh, webinar because we see a lot of that has different assets to speak. Uh, what is... Uh, 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 for one, legalities uh, about it. The second thing, why the, the medical experts are not speaking about it. And the third thing, like what we are using a much higher, uh, much more um, heavy narcotics like opioids uh, and morphine for the pain management, which literally makes you feel like you're a vegetable and are not able to function a lot uh, compared to something which, you know, like what we heard from N in Nikki in USA is widespread or in Canada, it's 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 legalized and it's becoming a trend and it feels like uh, in Europe we are lagging behind this. So let me go to the point uh, of addressing some of the questions and this is where now all of the panelists are invited to to contribute. Before doing that, one more final uh, poll that we have, and this is about have you ever been prescribed medical cannabis, uh, cannabis by a doctor? So remember before we were asking whether you have been using it for the medical reasons, but that might be like you can buy it not with a prescription. As we said, online, you just come in, in, in the shop, like Nikki was saying in US, you just come into a show in, like a candy shop and you want to, you can choose whatever you want. And uh, uh, this is where we saw when it is speaking about being prescribed by the doctor, doctors are very reluctant to speak about it. And yes, it is true when they are saying there is not a conclusive evidence that, uh, you know, cannabis, THC or CBD is actually doing anything to cure cancer. Okay, we don't have that claims. But we have a lot of the studies saying that they help to alleviate side effects of cancer, including also other, other diseases. And in these side effects, when, of course, it is mostly about the pain management, about the appetite loss, about uh, getting to sleep better. Uh, and there are many thousands of articles on it. And on top of that, you know, this is a plant that has been in use for the thousands of years in all of the different uh, cultures. Uh, and now we are somehow shying away from something which is uh, biological. So for me, myself, I have not used CBD or THC, uh, but uh, as I'm also a heading um, Lithuanian patient organization in cancer, which has over 20,000 patients. So when we speak with these patients, they say, you know, oh, this cannabis nowadays is like among top three uh, questions that they, they want to discuss about. This is why we are hosting this webinar today. So I'm ending the polling and the results show that there is one person that have actually, you know, from the once attendees who are here uh, that have been prescribed medical cannabis by, by the doctor um, and many that they have not been. We are still uh, have uh, over 50 people uh, participating. So we see that uh, it's a low number of people who are actually answering the polls. Uh, so some of them maybe are 
not just at their computer. But uh, let's go through, through the questions now. Uh, what, one good thing is to compare on the prices. So Anja Buchasch from Austria is, is writing that dronabinol in Austria comes uh, quite pricey as it varies on the demand of your use between 250 and 500 euros per month. And the challenge is that the cost uh, reimbursement has a lot of room for improvement. Also that the prescription process is challenging, which again leads patients in order to be able to help that they need to get it faster, they go to the black market. Uh, so when uh, Mariana, you were saying, you said it is like something 150, 250, but it's essentially like uh, 10 euros per gram, right? Nikki, can you, do you know the price? Like in Germany, what, what is the price for, you know, in total or per gram? That completely varies on what type are you getting, how high the THC dose is. So it starts at about seven to eight euros a gram, but it goes up to almost 20 if you get something with 95% THC in it. And how much of that you need to, to use? Like, is it gram per day or, or what? I think that really depends on the person. There's people who smoke it all day there's people who just smoke it to go to sleep um yeah so it's very individual how to say but we see that it's costly right but in germany it's being finally reimbursed and and we we heard that you i saw that you also answered that question uh, yeah, that uh, i get it reimbursed but i heard from a lot of people that they're not or that they're really struggling to make their health insurance reimburse them and um yeah i think it's it still needs to be talked about more so and in us to remember the price is it something similar uh, as it changes due to the strength pretty much similar it, it really depends on what you're getting and in the us the difference is you don't get it reimbursed by your health insurance you can in the states where there's rec recreational use and medical use allowed um, you just get a medical card, go inside the same dispensary as the people go for recreational use, but you just don't pay the taxes. So that's okay. the difference in the states. Yeah. Catherine, when you were prescribed, it was reimbursed, I assume, right, for, for your medicine. Me? Yeah, yeah. When you um, were prescribed. I'm in the UK, so the NHS... Um, provides prescriptions for cancer patients free of charge. Um, if you go for a normal prescription, it's about eight pounds per item, I think, currently. Um, but because mine was related to cancer, um, there was no money exchanged at any point. It just took the prescription into the pharmacist, handed the slip over, came out with a box of tablets or bottle of tablets, went home. And there was no co-payment? right just free. Yeah. yeah so i assume it's hard to know you know the prices and, and etc it's it doesn't have a price tag on it yeah uh, okay so uh, there was uh, another question which uh, i i see that andrea has answered uh, from the uh, tony montserrat but i know he's a cml patient advocate so hello tony there uh, and uh, tony was asking again in in uh, uh, that his hematologist suggested him to try cannabis before going to the serious pain, uh, painkillers, probably like, you know, something heavy and leading eventually to opioids, but did not prescribe or recommend anything. And uh, this is uh, news because it's it's good. We see like in, Sp in, uh, in Spain, you know, his hematologist, which is not a typical thing, even oncologists don't know that, they suggested maybe to try cannabis. So we see very some awareness within the medical community. But then, you know, he was left uh, with no further guidance. As he said, he did not know there is a different types by that, I assume. It only means CBD and THC and different strengths of it. And you may not really need uh, something very strong. Uh, and, and uh, you know, depending on what you try to do. Uh, and what Tony was asking where, where to buy it or, or what to do as he doesn't want to smoke anything because smoking is when you think it's THC and it is weed. But when we are speaking about tablets, 
or uh, edibles. This is what Andrea and Haranza was saying that, uh, you know, there's a lot of edibles and you can find this online and looking into the CBD, you buy them and eat a bit as a, as a gummy beers. And I saw that there was another question related uh, to this. Uh, so now let's go to the, to the open questions. Uh, I am hoping to write an article for Leafy on cannabis use among youth, and I would love a chance to speak to anyone that would be willing to share your experience of cannabis use or not using. Uh, want to show what we have talked about today, how cannabis can help during cancer treatment, how to use it, where to get it, etc. Uh, and thank you for such an informative webinar. This is by Lauren Medlick. That. So thank you, Lauren, for raising this out. You see there are, there are patients uh, in, in here, you know, feel free to reach out to us at Youth Cancer Europe. You'll, you'll see us in, in, in the Facebook uh, page so we can discuss more, but it would be also useful to hear from an attendees, maybe not just the questions, but your, uh, you know, comments or something we, we should be discussing because we are, you know, still have time on our webinar uh that uh, that we can go deeper in those questions because we want to answer something where we have clarity and when addressed when there is a lack of clarity including you know what is legal or not legal uh, so uh, another question was does thc help with pain more than cbd and who wants to answer that nikki i can um it does it really does. Um, there is different kinds of THC. Some help you deal with pain better than others, but it it really does help a lot more. So in essence, CBD because it's psychotropic activity, so it blocks your feeling, to, you know, of all of the pain, and essentially it is a much stronger essence. Whereas, like in CBD, we we'll, see a lot of people use it for relaxation. Uh, you know, or, or just get more focused. So it's a bit like you think essential oils, right? You take essential oil, something which has like a per peppermint and you feel, you know, all energized. But uh, uh, imagine, you know, something where you have really, really strong pain. Uh, try to sniff as many essential oils as you want. I don't think that will be a lot of, of help to use. And this is why this is where probably the THC cannabis are mostly used for. Uh, so we have another broad question, which is, what are the first steps to decriminalize cannabis in the EU? So one thing is when we are discussing cannabis uh, in a broad sense, including recreational use, where we see like in, they, they are legal in Netherlands. And another thing is what we are discussing today is whether this cannabis should be allowed to be used in the cancer uh, therapy, not just for treat, not for treating the cancer, but for alleviating side effects. Uh, so, guys, let me ask all of you. Uh, maybe starting with James and Catherine. In terms in UK, do you have a public debate going on about this use of cannabis uh, for medical use? Is there a lot of buzz? Uh, because you know, in in many countries that we were feel is seeing in Central Eastern Europe, there is a lot of talks. Or do you, are you guys still on the Brexit situation and the COVID? <laughs> um, I think it's become quite a mainstream conversation. So we have one major like health food retailer called Holland and Barrett, um, which I know couldn't be more English. Um, and uh, they stock and sell. I think even if you go on their website, they have a whole area dedicated to CBD products. Um, and I think it's kind of become not fashionable because it's not even fashionable because like my aunt is like a CBD convert and she is not a fashionable lady. Um, but, and by that, I don't mean like fashionable. I mean like trendy. She's not on top of the most on trend things. Um, but yeah, I would say it's quite a mainstream thing here. I think THC is more um, like uh, Katie was saying earlier, it's sort of seen as like the naughty cousin. It's not really spoken about as much. I think there seems to be a split down the middle here where people tend to think that CBD is medical and there's no medical use of THC, which 
I don't think that's actually true, but I think that's the simplifica simplification, the kind of view over here. I don't know what James's view is. I think I uh, pretty much agree with Kat, some pretty good points about just how it seems that CBD is the more spoken about aspects of it, but it seems that every few years it gets raised in government again about the discussion about legalizing cannabis. Um, I mean, this is why the drug has moved up and down the legality scale as well. So, of course, we classify drugs um, as A, B and C, dependent on their um, severity and impact um, in society, etc. Um, and cannabis has moved up and down that spectrum quite a lot over the years. And it's something that just regularly comes back um, into the topic of discussion. And I think regarding like first steps to getting it legalized, I think they're already underway uh, with regards to medical use. Um, especially, um, I think further action though, it's again, lobbying, comp like having these sorts of conversations, understanding that this, it's not just to get you high. There's also a lot of medical use behind it. And again, further research, so. Uh, Andrea, what about Spain? Is there a lot of discussion on in, in the public eye? I mean, on, on the legalization of cannabis and for I medical use not? Think, I think Spain is a little bit behind the UK in that sense. Um, there might be some associations that are like lobbying for it harder, but at the moment, I'm not sure at what stage is in the government. Um, also, there's so many issues in Spanish government that, I, yeah, anyway. Um, but I would like to think that people are starting to realize how helpful it is in terms of medical use and not just like recreational. Um, but sadly, up until my parents' generation, I think they have this stigma of you know, the we let's get high um, and let's just, you know, lay in the couch and watch a movie kind of kind of thing instead of I can be a part of society and contribute and use this for the pain if I need to. It's not going to make me, you know, like a couch potato. Um, but I really don't know. I need to do some research on it because things change quite quickly. But it's just the young people that are like pushing for it. But because, you know, Spanish people can be quite cheeky. Um, they, sometimes the lines are a little bit blurred in terms of like what the use is for. And, you know, you can go in the streets and as Tony has mentioned, you can get it off the streets uh, without a problem if you know what to look for. Um, but people should start thinking more like um, how helpful it is um because you know it can be more helpful than just have an aspirin um but yeah like i would love to have a chat with my doctors and be like right guys this is what's going to happen i'm going to do this because i think it's going to be more helpful to you know take pills and have you know at the moment i'm taking 14 pills a day um it wouldn't be so much easier if i could like lower that dose and help um in exchange of having some cannabis you know, um, but because people is not on the loop a lot. I think, you know, people need to start loving a little bit more. But sometimes when you're going through treatment, and, and at least that was my case, you you, you need to you do the steps you're, you're, you're told to. Um, when you have like a pressure diagnosis and you're like, right, you need to do A, B, C, E, you don't think of, you know, well, maybe what's other option? if that makes sense at least in my case my diagnosis was so quick and I had to go into treatment and things were like really quick that once you're in the loop you don't even think oh maybe I could just do this it's easier for people looking back like what I'm doing now um but yeah I mean it's it's tricky I'm not gonna lie it's, it's quite tricky in Spain at the minute like you see, it's like everyone is uh, speaking it indoors, behind the closed doors, but openly there's oh, yeah. still a lot of controversy in, yeah. in that. Even the, the, what do you say, the smell is in the air, right? Everyone is oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, something. yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I think the problem is, um, as I say, up to my parents' generations, and maybe people are a little bit younger, and they, are, they still have this idea of, you know, kind of Woodstock, music and weed 
type of mm. type of thing. They they don't stop and think how THC can be used differently or how CBD. You know, I have to explain to my parents like I'm having this CBD thing, but I'm not going to be high as a kite. You know, this is just for anxiety and for the pain, but it's not going to make me high. And at first they were a little bit suspicious, you know. Um, but in the end, they've seen it works. And it's not making me less functional. So they're happy with it. So I think it's a kind of like, maybe like test and try and like show people um, and lobbying. But if people see that it's going to be useful, maybe they'll stop change, start changing their minds. So what is the situation in your neighbor country, in Portugal, uh, about, so Mariana, we heard, you know, there was a law in place, but what it looks like, you know, in 2018, we passed the law, in 2021, we need to implement it, but it's not like on a public eye, as you said, even the doctors, we don't know what we need to do right now. So is, is this debate still um, coming, you know, like do it practically or like we are saying, okay, it's solved, we passed the law, you know, you can get it from pharmacy and the, there's no more public debate on this. Uh, so yeah, right now, I think people are uh, more open to, to this idea, to this topic. And uh, at the moment, I, I think doctors, there's actually a group of doctors that are more familiar with the usage of the plant for medical purposes. And uh, I think they will be providing, they will be providing trainings to physicians who are not as familiar and also developing a manual on good practices. And I think this will help to reduce the stigma because um, I think that a lot of doctors from what I read are uh, still a bit hesitant to prescribe this product that has such a high dosage of THC because they fear that, for example, there will be uh, psychotic symptoms such as um, hallucinations, paranoia, panic attacks, like the, the so-called bad trips. I think they fear that this will happen a lot. So they, I think there's still a lot of stigma around it. Um, and uh, regarding the decriminalization question, uh, Portugal was actually the first country in the world to just dis discriminal decriminalize decriminalize all, decriminalize. <laughs> all, all the drugs, all drugs as, and uh, cannabis included. So uh, right now I know that um, uh, there's the both the possession and the consumption of up to 25 grams of uh, the dry flour, and I think it's uh, two uh, grams of cannabis oil. Um, it is uh, discriminalized. So if you are caught on the streets, for example, with something less than 25 grams of uh, the dry plant, uh, you won't go to jail. You will. You won't be considered a criminal. Basically, what will happen is that you you would be referred to specialized uh, uh, support services because you would be seen as a person who needs help and you would probably, I think the worst thing that could happen would be to pay a fine. So you would either be referred to these services to, or do, for example, community work, like community work for the um, work for the community, like do charity work, for example, or pay a fine. Uh, but if you have anything above these dosages that I mentioned, then you would have to deal with the criminal process in the courts and everything. And unfortunately, I think this, is, this was something that was happening to a lot of patients who are trying to get, um, to get cannabis through the black market. Thank you. Thank you, Mariana, for that input. I am looking into the comment that we received from, via Facebook. Uh, this is from uh, Gil, Giliosa Gilly from France, uh, who is uh, a patient advocate in melanoma space. And Gilly has shared an uh, article uh, publication from a small study where it shows that if the patients are using uh, immunotherapy or checkpoint blockade uh, up to 50 percent uh, and if they are using a cannabis during uh, the, the therapy of immunotherapy uh, or checkpoint bl blockaders that they half their uh, treatment effect by 50 percent meaning that you know you take cannabis and you reduce effect of other therapy so we should not just uh, speak on the upsides but also on the dime downsides I could also speak to a uh, certain situation that I'm personally aware of, uh, of, a, of a patient who has passed away uh, from the lung cancer and of course she was living with a stage four lung cancer and et cetera. 
and uh, she was taking uh, the THC uh, in Austria uh, as uh, in, in, in like a treatment care setting. Uh, but uh, that was a different physician, not oncologist, uh, speaking with her. And she did not say to oncologists that she was getting a targeted therapy, immunotherapy. And uh, when she told that, she said, well, actually, you blocked all of the effect of your immunotherapy. So meaning that the thing that you took uh, THC and you did not tell doctor about it made her uh, effective therapy useless. And well, her disease progressed and she passed within three months or so. So what is an important to say here that, you know, if you're using a THC cannabis, don't do it on your own. You must tell your oncologist, you know, about what you're having, same as if you're using other food supplements, because this is a very often that, uh, you know, uh, patients do think separately from what doctors tell them to do. It's something I think in a human nature. Uh, and it is also that when the doctors don't know why the uh, um, treatment that was prescribed is not working, you keep they keep changing the therapies. Maybe that one will work, etc. But sometimes it's just uh, reducing the, the supplement uh, that the patient might be taking. So that it is important uh, to say. So thank you, thank you, Gilly, for a heads up. But again, when we were speaking about what is a safe discussion to have, is that of course, ideally, discuss with your treating physician about your treatment options, also including what could help you to alleviate the side effects that you have in your cancer therapy. And as we know, there are many patients who are going on an active therapy, chemotherapy, bone marrow transplantations, um, radiotherapy, maintenance therapy for years, not few months, but a years. And throughout that process, they need, a, they face a lot of side effects and they need things uh, that could help them with. And often, sadly, we see that oncologists don't have time to address these concerns with the patients. They would focus where the disease is progressing or it's stalling. And it's mostly by the time you are not able to get to the next chemo cycle because you are too frail, they would say, okay, what you are having, what we could do. And probably that discussion should happen earlier. We have another question from Bense. Uh, that is, I think, a fair question for us to discuss. Do you believe that the legalization of over-the-counter cannabis-based drugs will be abused by legal organizations or by addicts? If so, do you believe that the risk is worth it? So in other words, whether legalizing cannabis will not do more harm than, uh, than good. So what are your thoughts? I, by, before that, I could say that Tony uh, Montserrat from Spain also really answered that, the, well, the black market already exists, so you're not changing anything. But if we are addressing in the topic of a medical cannabis, which should be legalized and distributed uh, through pharmacies, which are controlled, then it is much better than you are getting something which is not, not regulated at all, and it's totally under the dark. Any ideas, Nikki? Um, personally, I think um, that just like, what was his name? Someone said ben that. Black no, the guy Tony, who replied to Tony. Him, Tony. Tony. Um, he said that the black market already exists and he's absolutely right. I think decriminalizing it would help massively because it would also bring whichever country a massive tax income a massive increased tax income so and that could be put back in to for example healthcare so i actually yeah, so think legalizing instead of they're making it legal at least for medical use is a really good step and also for the most part cannabinoids and thc have less damaging impact on your kidneys and livers which strong pain, pain medications always do so so that's a, a pros right that we know the strong painkillers they destroy your organs as well for the something which is of natural nature organic they they don't have that much of a uh, the, the harm to the internal systems etc other thoughts andrea on 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 this No, I think I think that's that's something that it's quite um, right. I mean, I would rather 
um, be having some gummies instead of all of those pills, as I've mentioned before. Um, and, you know, when you're going through chemo and you're getting lots of drugs pumped into your body, um, why don't you use something that is natural? You know, if you're like watching you, what you eat and um, stop getting like taking like toxins, like don't drink alcohol, don't, don't do lots of things. Why don't take things on board like if you're supposed to eat more greens like why don't you why not using things that are available in nature you know and I'm not saying this in the hippie way but as in if it's helpful and it's not going to do any harm why don't take advantage of it mm -hmm. so well you know we we are again trying to be cautious like we are not promoting it but again mm -hmm. we're saying let's explore the options let's also be there for see what the medical data says because we always hear that there is no data supporting this on the other side we hear that there are thousands of articles published on the clinical outcomes of the use of cannabis one or another form in this and that number of patients so it's just about whether you're looking into it or not lo looking into it um, and uh, I want to read a comment not, which is not posted through a Q&A, but about a personal story that Gavris Kosman has shared. Um, and and he, he wrote that I have had cancer for over 25 years. I have 12 recurrences, meaning progressions, and I can say that the classic treatments have run out in my case. Also, I have been using cannabis for more than 10 years for recreational purposes. I have been using it for medical purposes for over one year. I use CBD oils uh, in combination with THC. Uh, I have come to have such a high tolerance to THC that I don't even feel high anymore. Uh, and uh, this is where then uh, Gavris was posting a question. Can anyone tell me which European country is the most open in terms of cannabis to live and have access to cannabis products for medical purposes? So what we can say, this is Netherlands. Uh, we wanted to have Lizanne here, who is from Netherlands, and just to explain that situation, but to, due to her personal health reasons, she's not here but maybe we can ask katie for you to share the screen again and go into that slide where it shows uh, in which countries it is legal uh, and where you are not being prosecuted so that we could just have again a bit a bit more of that of that map and uh, while katie is looking into that slide uh, i am uh, going through another qu question uh, not question, comment from Boyan Ristovsky, because the war on drugs has stigmatized the use of cannabis and all research stopped into this in the 70s, so 50 years ago. Doctors and governments in many countries are still conservative about using it because they don't know about it much. And then we have uh, uh, a question from anonymous uh, participant, but what are the main arguments why your oncologist talks you out of CBD, THC supplements used it, even if it is legal and available as an option. Is it different with palliative care physicians? And in, in here, uh, we'll answer this, okay? But as we have the, the screen uh, being shared right now with our happy weed guide <laughs> uh, below. So uh, let's see where we mean it's green, right? The green column means that it is legal. So here, uh, we see that in Croatia is decriminalized and it, it's legal. In uh, in Finland, it's illegal but sometimes not enforced. Legal under license. In Germany, we heard it uh, from the uh, Nikki that uh, for the patients who are uh, have a prescription, uh, it's it's good to be used. Luxembourg decriminalized and it's legal, well, yet very small country. Uh, for Malta, decriminalized up to 30 grams and six plants, if I read it con correctly, and it's legal. With Netherlands, we see it's, it's legal. Consumption uh, should be used. Uh, I can't see that, but possession uh, up to five grams is decriminalized. Uh, and what else? Well, we, we discussed Portugal and I think that's it. So this is the latest, uh, you know, rap sheet what we were able to find in, in a public uh, public domain. So thank you, Katie, for sharing that. Um, I'll cut the screen. Uh, and so back to that, to that question that I wanted again to, um, uh, the last one I raised, why did oncologists do not 
not, I would not address the topic of CBD or THC, or I would prefer the different options. And whether we see that there is any change when we're speaking with palliative care physicians. From my experience in Lithuania, I see that actually palliative care physicians are the ones that are very in favor of using cannabis. And what we are saying like now, we are prescribing patients on the opioids and well, pretty much, you know, you cannot even assess the health status of a, of a patient who is constantly sedated, that he cannot speak or, you know, he's not, not in the right mind. So for one thing, uh, you know, you're not able to measure con uh, conscious element of it, uh, but it's also that uh, down the lane, you know, there is an addiction. Uh, and the addiction of opioids, we've heard terrible stories from US, you know, where, where it has been a mass uh, class action suits for the, you know, pharmaceutical companies hiding about the uh, addictive effects of opioids and then it back, backfiring on them with the billions of fines and et cetera. Uh, so again, maybe I would go to Nikki and Catherine on this because this is where your doctors prescribed you, maybe Catherine first. So you, you said it's good that your consultant, the treating physician that did, uh, did prescribe uh, it. Uh, what is your opinion if it would be in palliative care setting? Is it like a more topic? Because we see James was also in UK. No one has suggested him cannabis for a pain relief. In your instance, we heard you were in a specialized hospital. We did not ask James if he was in a specialized hospital. Where are you, uh, James, in a specialized cancer here hospital, like a center of, of excellence? Uh, I was on a clinical trial uh, as part of a hematology center, but um, the overall hospital that I was treated under um, was just a, a general uh, large hospital um, in Birmingham. So not a, uh, not a no, cancer not a center. Specialized. Yeah, not a cancer yeah. center. Yeah, thank you. So Catherine, what are your feelings? Um, I think, yeah, generally, I would say that palliative care physicians um, and healthcare providers in that field are more open to things that are traditionally seen as experimental. I think once you're in palliative care, the focus becomes much more, it's like a stock phrase, but making you comfortable. Um, I think in wider oncology and generally in wider healthcare the emphasis is getting you better if you want that's like their key performance indicator is getting you better whereas in palliative care the focus is what makes your life better and your quality of life which is a totally different metric um so i i would say not just for cannabis but for anything that might be considered like experimental um, or like unorthodox um, palliative care healthcare providers I think are more open at least to trying and then if it doesn't work it's not a big deal whereas I think when the focus is curative um, there's less wiggle room if you like there's less mm -hmm. willingness to risk um, which there's I suppose there's lots of cultural reasons for that cultural within healthcare not like cultural within countries very very well said in terms of the different uh, indicators or the metrics that uh, that we are using and in palliative care it actually changes to to what normally oncologists would be looking nikki uh, you, you also had an experience of being treated in us and in germany and even in germany uh, you know you, you are now getting uh, the medicine but do you see like a different mentality on the discussion on speaking maybe uh, one question is on cannabis when you speak with oncologists in in germany and oncologists in usa and just more broadly addressing the the you know the supplement issues maybe it's not with oncologists maybe with the nurse but do you see like in us maybe it's more open or proactive like like the healthcare professional is suggesting it rather than patient trying to get a bit of, of information out well, of him in the us it's pretty much an open conversation already and you just just have to have a certain medical condition to apply for the card and it's not that much of a hustle and over here in germany it's probably similar to the uk um 
when people are on palliative care, it's a lot easier to get it done for them. And a lot more doctors are willing to do it. So, yeah. Mariana, let me also ask you the same question because, well, you were traveling from a different country. You go to UK, right, to uh, to a part of your therapies. So, what, what again? Maybe not on cannabis because, well, you said you you haven't used it, but uh, on just speaking on the supplements used with with oncologists. Where do you feel like they are more open in Portugal to discuss these issues or in the UK? Uh, well, uh, as I mentioned before, I was told that uh, there's a certain vitamin supplement, vitamin E supplement that is not recommended. And it, this was told by the um, doctor that is uh, seeing me at, at the, in the UK. So I think, uh, yes, probably in the UK, I feel people are more open to these topics. And even here in Portugal, maybe they don't have as much knowledge around the nutrition uh, part of treatments and everything uh, so yeah i feel like um, in the uk they are definitely more more open to these discussions mm -hmm. yeah general feeling so now we have a more precise uh, questions i think we have like three more questions that will answer and uh, then we'll wrap it up for a day uh, so one is is it normal to use thc uh, even after finishing chemotherapy treatments i'm afraid of being or getting addicted so about addicted to thc so we heard from nikki for instance like nikki you were again sorry to put you on a spot but you are the best expert from the lay patient point of view that we had like you have been using it for long so do you feel like there are things of addiction uh, to thc over time but Really, I can go without it without struggling or having withdrawal symptoms. But the one comment that was mentioned earlier that I don't really get high of it anymore, that happens every once in a while. So if I smoke consistently for a really long period, I don't really get high anymore at the end of that period. If I stop smoking for a week or two completely mm -hmm. and then start back, I'm high again. Right. So it's again, because the question is quite broad when we say after finishing chemotherapy, so assuming it's for the pain management, but if it's also, it is, if it is for the appetite loss, for uh, instance, where in Catherine, they were prescribing her specific thing just, uh, you know, to get the weight up and to get Catherine eating up during chemotherapy and after that. So that means, you know, it's not just THC. There is so many different things of CBD, what they do and whether it's oil, it's pills, it's whatever, you know, edible, uh, just tons of the products to, to, to lose, uh, check from. Um, but I think what all of us being here today collectively can be doing is to not rock, rock the boat or say, you know, you know, uh, free the weed or whatever, we, but it's here like this is something which demands the discussion. And, uh, you know, when the patient steps up and is asking the healthcare professional about these questions, what we expect for the healthcare professionals to have an opinion not just walk away of a topic of pro or prescribe opioids, which is the easiest way, but we definitely say that it's not such a good way for the long-term addictiveness due to the damage to your organs, also due to the way you are not able to function uh, as a, you know, in, in your mental state uh, very well. So another comment from Anya, who is living in Austria and was explaining that uh, uh, the pricing situation in Austria, that the new co government and coalition are now campaigning strongly for legalizing uh, cannabis based on the German system. So now we heard from Nikki that German system did not work for long, but now we say we hear like it's it's coming to in place and even for the portugal where we heard from mariana that you know it has been passed but three years later it's still not working so what we probably should take as a learning that even after this new you know legalizing decriminalizing you know regulating it for the medical use once those laws are adopted it still takes several years for all of that to be put in practice and this is not something you could expect from day one to change uh, and uh, then this is what we need to be mindful when, again, what I was explaining, if you are able to order it online somewhere in a different country, uh, be sure to check what is your local uh, 
red regulation so that you would not end up uh, felon, you know, just for receiving the shipment of something you bought legally with your credit card in a different European Union country. How can we improve awareness of cannabis benefits? Well, I think it's not for Youth Cancer Europe to trump it. There's many, many uh, people doing it. I think what we are here for as a general trend is just to explore the different alternatives and to focus more on the topics which are not discussed most of the time. And this is something what is the management techniques for the side effects, uh, managing of side effects. Uh, and it is also for using something which is natural. You know, we, we have all of the green teas, we, we have all of these essential oils, we can use more rest and etc. And, uh, you know, it helps and we are not discussing the, the effects of this. So this is a, a good, good thing to say. I'm sorry, I'm being bothered because some my dad actually is calling me nonstop on Messenger. So I keep declining him. Um, and that's probably a sign for me that we should not be going on forever. Uh, but uh, just as as a final uh, final point, I, I see that the, well, the, the, uh, the main questions that the audience here has been asking was about was about uh, is it legal? Then is it reimbursed? Then what are the differences? What is the da data backing it up? And uh, you know how not to be addictive to this. So again, what is good in this that you can research a lot of that information, not you know just through our webinar, but there's a lot of open references. You just need to Google it. By now, there is a lot of information available. Uh, on all of these things that we have discussed. So right now it was just to put it from the under the stone up into the public debate for us again to have this uh, exercise to share our lived experience and what is the uh, our feelings living in different different countries being right now in 2021 still under the lockdown of the COVID and still seeing that the, you know there's a more late stage cancers because the patients are not coming up for the appointments. There's a lot of self-medication because again, patients are not getting that much access to their healthcare professionals and there are issues around it. So now as we are wrapping up, I would just want to uh, leave uh, each of you, uh, you know, ask you to say sentence or two after this webinar about what is a thing you would recommend to the healthcare professional you know, not to the patients, but to the healthcare professional, based on your experience, what you think could be better when you were going through your cancer therapy and discussing the cannabis or side effects, what would it make it better uh, for you in, in looking backwards? But we hope that this would be useful for other patients who might be hearing this. Can we start with uh, Andrea? So, I mean, as you said, and as I said before, looking backwards, it's it's easier. And when you're like freshly diagnosed, you you have you know an insane amount of information to to digest and and to deal with. So I think if if healthcare professionals could take you know a little time to do some research and to offer the option, because you know. Um, you have the medication, you have all the drugs, and you have all of these chemically induced things that are going to go into your body. But maybe this natural thing um, is going to help. Um, but as I said, many people don't even want to, to do the research. They just want to give things um, a try without having to think because you're, you're very busy um, processing everything. So maybe if, if doctors can, can you know, do their due diligence and offer the option, um, you know, and maybe like chew the information in and in, in digest it and like give it in like bite-sized doses to the patients just so they have the option to choose whether they want to try or not. I think that that would be great, you know. Thank you, Andrea. James, what are your thoughts? Uh, I completely agree with Andrea in the fact of it'd be great if doctors would do more research around it for their patients at this point um, and be able to offer them the alternatives to normal medicine. 
I think, uh, you know, being able to offer those alternatives as opposed to just pumping people full of drugs and kind of hoping to see what sticks is probably a pretty good alternative and giving people that choice, you know, giving people their decision, putting their fate in their hands in a sort of aspect, whether they can take clinical drugs and see what it does to their body or they can take something that's, I don't know, a bit more experimental, a bit more natural. So empowering right. patients to be a part of the clinical decision-making process. Very, very well said, James. Mariana? Well, I would say that those, uh, those doctors that already have some knowledge on this topic, maybe they could share this and even share some clinical uh, cases and stories of their own patients with other doctors that are less familiar with it. Maybe if these uh, opinions are coming from one of them, it will be more credible and they will uh, take it in consideration for when dealing with other patients uh, who are maybe thinking of um, considering using medical cannabis. Mm -hmm. Nikki? Um, I also agree with Andrea and James. And also, I would love to see doctors put actual research in it, like bring it up for a clinical trial and see how patients react to it with different types of cancers and chemotherapies or different types of treatments in general, because that would bring a more solid base to the topic and other doctors might get more comfortable prescribing it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so let's wrap up with Catherine. Um kind of echoing everything that everyone's already said I think I would say to clinicians and healthcare providers to be willing to move on in terms of research because you know opioids which we use pretty much all the time started off as poppies like that was a natural remedy and there's research going on now not just in terms of cannabis but with ketamine with psilocybin magic mushrooms there's lots of exciting new research. And I think the worst thing for clinicians to do is to be blinkered, you know, be open-minded to these research results and clinical trials and everything that everyone's already said. Mm -hmm. Well, as we say, well, the message from this side of the panel is unanimous. Like, yes, we, we need a more open conversation conversations the patients need to be empowered we need more research if they are doubting that there is enough uh, research and uh, we just need to know about what are all of the treatment options not just the ones that someone is considered to be the only option but just let let's uh, explore this together so with that we will be ending our content part of the uh, of the youth cancer europe webinar for today but uh, i'm very glad to see that we still have a uh, more than half of attendees uh, bearing with us for oh, after these two hours of webinar. You are awesome and thank you for your questions and thank you for your good warm messages that you found this interesting or helpful or that uh, you, you liked the uh, opportunity to catch up with your fellow cancer uh, survivors. What I would want to also say now is uh, that you have a say in what uh, next YC webinar would look like. Suggest us a topic, say what is of interest. After our first webinar, which was on mental health, we saw that there was this need to discuss about the use of cannabis. And this is why we had the webinar today. And now if you feel like there is a topic that is uh, you know, underrepresented, it is uh, more of a stigma. People are not daring to touch it. Well, we are the ones that want to tackle this. You know, in mental health, we were going for the fertility preservation about the fear of being infertile and lack of not knowing the situation here on cannabis where someone thinks it is just, you know, weed and smoking the weed. We were explaining and exploring you that it's much more than that and it helps alleviate side effects under the prescribed conditions. Uh, so be... Uh, engage with us, you know, post us uh, your, your suggestions as a comment uh, in Youth Cancer Europe uh, Facebook or on our Twitter. And uh, the recording will be there. Uh, so you will be able to see it and uh, rewind it. So thank you for spending your time on Tuesday, bearing two hours with us. And we hope that uh, our open conversations help you up to 
be vocal in your own uh, situation where whether you think you should raise a topic with your healthcare professional, nurse, doctor, family doctor. So just be there and do it. And if you are not, uh, do not think there is enough information how to do it properly, reach out to us. You know, we are here as a community to help each other. And, uh, you know, despite COVID and lockdowns that we would want to see each other physically face to face and we're missing all of this, well, at least this is a way to, uh, to recap, get together and uh, share our, our thoughts on the topic. And I want to thank all of our fam uh, panelists to, again, being so engaging, staying uh, on, online, uh, reacting to all of the questions that we have received, and just thank you for your great contributions. So wishing you all of a nice evening, and see you in the next YC webinar. Thank you, guys. Goodbye. <laughs>